So, I don't know why Tammy chose me to do this, but I have a lot more admiration for Mark at this point. <laughs> a lot more. Um, so, at any rate, I was asked if I would do this analysis on this week's verse. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies that you present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. That's the New King James Version. But by today's standards, this may seem to be my request. And it's kind of interesting because based on who I listen to and what I've recently been re reading, it it didn't it wasn't that difficult to do this for me. Um, I've come to believe it may be it may even be more than we realize, but overall perhaps it can be more readily understood than we often find the Bible to be. I just finished reading the book Radical, Taking Back Your Faith from the American Dream by David Platt. <coughs> I barely finished it prior to having written this. I also believe, to put it in the words of Christian speaker, author, and theologian Lisa Harper, I may have a platonic spiritual crush on Francis Chan. I can't quite get enough of his teachings. Pastor Chan and David Platt, along with our Pastor Tammy, seem to have similar heartstrings and somewhat similar beliefs. Please note, however, that the words that follow are not are only what I've taken from the Word of God and these individuals. Our nation seems to have changed over the years, and many of us find ourselves becoming more and more concerned with some of these changes and what may come out of them. Unfortunately, I do not believe it has been just our nation that has changed, but also our churches over the years. Christ's messages were much like those of Francis Chan, quite clear and direct. He never promised his followers followers much in the way of acceptance outside that of his own, the fathers, and the church, but not that we would be accepted by the world should we determine to take up our cross and follow him as it states we ought to do in Matthew 16, 24. As a matter of fact, Christ also told his disciples, I am sending you like sheep among wolves in Matthew 10, 16. You see, Christ never sugarcoated his messages. He was quite straightforward when, when speaking to the masses. He said, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only the one who does the will of my Father in heaven. And that's from Matthew 7, 21 through 23. Today, many pastors have become so concerned with building churches and numbers, they have begun to preach that all one needs to do is say a prayer of acceptance becomes, to become saved, thereby being ensured a place in heaven. Far too many today are of the belief that it is more important to be accepted, and that if the masses find it to be okay, then it must be okay. After all, we are all entitled to live the American dream, and we all enjoy seeing how many likes we can get on some form of social media. Christ, however, states, and do not fear those who kill the body but cannot kill the soul, but rather fear him who is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. Matthew 10, 28. Today's verse also references that our bodies be holy. Folks, I do not think any one of us are able to make our own bodies holy. This is an act that can only take place through the work of God, the Father, His Son, Jesus Christ, and the Holy Spirit. It also genuinely requires, generally, excuse me, requires our willingness and efforts to do the will of God. The will of God can really only be discerned through time in God's Word and time on our knees in prayer to Him. Jesus says in Matthew 22, 36 through 40 from the ESV version, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment, and the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments depend all the law and the prophets. David Platt said in 2010 that the world population was a little over 6 billion. 
well, almost seven billion and counting. He goes on to to liberally estimate that at that time, 4.5 billion of these individuals were separated from God in their sin, and assuming nothing changes, will spend an eternity in hell. The great commission of Christ before he left earth was that we go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything that I have commanded you. It is my belief, to the best of my current knowledge and information, that as Christians, we are to be willing to fearlessly live our lives loving God above all things on this earth and sacrificially loving others in all we do. In the understanding that if they do not have a personal relationship with Christ, they will one day be damned to an eternity in hell. I sadly do not believe that many of us live this out with the urgency it requires. And in all honesty, I have to admit that I too was in this boat not long ago. David Platt provides a year-long year five-step challenge to put an end to the to the way far too many of us use to walk our Christian walk. If you might be interested in this, please feel free to let me know, and I will gladly provide you with a copy, or better yet, check out his book. He brings this point home far better than I'm able to. In summary, we must all have a personal relationship with Christ through time in the Word and in prayer. We must live, not just say that we're willing to, a sacrificial life toward God and others that is devoted to doing the will of God in bringing others to the Lord and shepherding them in their initial first steps after having repented and become baptized in Christ. That was excellent, wasn't it? Yes. And I'm going to turn this off, hoping I don't interfere with all of it. Thank you, Miss Deb. That was that was so very good. Okay. Clash of Kingdoms. Everybody knows I changed the first one, changed its name, and I am have been so fascinated with this series. And this is the last of the messages, and I'll be drawing on some of the other things that I've been saying uh, with the other two. But this series has probably been the most talked about since the beginning of 2616, since it started. And what's so amazing is everything that it has brought in, the questions it's brought in, the thoughts it's brought in, the change of heart that it has brought in, which I absolutely love. But I have said many times, um, I learn as much as y'all do when developing these messages. When God puts a message on my heart, I am learning also. And um, most of these series, not only what I have learned, but it's also, I think the one that touches my heart the most is the conversation. The conversation that has uh, gone on. It's just, it's been absolutely amazing. Now my prayer concerning this little church of 2616, and I hope it is the prayer of everybody in here, is that we become so kingdom-minded kingdom mindset that you don't even have to wonder about God's presence in your life. You don't question it. That you are walking so closely with him that the light of Christ Jesus shines brilliantly through you to others. But better than that, that you don't even know it. That makes it even better. So it was two, three weeks ago I was talking to a friend um, of mine about this petition that we have out there, which I'll be turning that in tomorrow, so please get the corrections done on there. Um, and it was her and some of her family that did choose to sign it. 
And as Christians, we know that it is the right thing to do. We talked about it. Um, and that is to stand for justice and righteousness. But it is to protect the vulnerable, which in this case is our children. It's for the protection of our children. But with all that said, what about the protection of parents' rights, which is a part of the way this country was founded. So we're protecting three different things by standing up and signing this petition. Sadly, as many numbers that they have turned in, there I don't know what the count is. Do y'all know what the count is? They, it's more than enough to stop this petition from going to the polls in 2024. The Secretary of State said, no, we're not doing it. That gives me chills. Broke my heart. Because I thought the people ran our country. We are getting to a place where the people are not running our country. And I'm going on a bunny trail, I know that. As hard as it is, do you not believe that God knows it? That God is sovereign? Elijah, I think I was telling Pam, there's someone else I brought up. Elijah had gotten himself so worn out from trying to preach the word of God, from trying to do what's right, from letting everybody know what God had to say to tell them because they were in dust, they were in bad trouble. And so he's sending Elijah. But there was a point in time, I believe, Elijah said, Nobody cares. That's how he felt. He was so tired, and then Jezebel, you know, was threatening him. Now, miracles had happened. Miracles had happened through Elijah. What's he do? He takes off. I'm done. I'm running. I'm at you know. My life is being threatened. This man was tired and he was ready to give up. But what happened? God strengthened him, built him back up to help him to understand that through all that was going on, he was still there and he was very aware of it. So there is a purpose I don't know what that purpose is. There is a plan that God will have in figuring this out that we may not understand because it makes no sense to us. I do know that this group that has put this petition out, they've been around for a very long time and they do have an attorney. I don't know if they will be able to file a lawsuit. I have no idea. But what is the number one thing that God's people can be doing right now. Right. Exactly. Get on our knees and pray. God wants to hear from His people. We have put Him so far behind us. But he wants to hear us. He wants us to come back to Him. He wants us to trust in Him. And like Miss Deb said, we're not to be worrying about our bodies, are we? It's about the soul. And those are the things to remember. Big bunny trail. I knew that was coming. Sometimes the right thing to do isn't always reflected from so-called Christians, going back to my friends. The kingdom mindset that Christians are to reflect turns to reflecting a different kingdom. And if you remember right, there are only two concerning our souls. Now, I've read a couple articles where people will pull in three. They'll put the human kingdom within that. But when we're talking about the soul, there is only two. One of the world and Satan, and one of God's righteousness and truth. And sadly, not all of this family chose to soul, sign this petition. And the reason began for it is something happened in their life that caused them to read this petition and look at it in a different light. And it was taken out of context because of their own experiences. One of their children chose to take the path of the gay lifestyle. 
and it was very heartbreaking. It's still heartbreaking. It would be. And this has been going on for quite a few years. It didn't change the fact that they didn't love this child of theirs. They loved him very, very much. What changed and what I feel was more detrimental and more tragic was the reaction that came from so-called Christians. Condemnation. And then as a result, they no longer participate in any church and they want nothing to do with the Christian world. These were very strong, faithful and it, it broke my heart when I hold, heard the story. I was thinking, if this response of condemnation or hate, whatever it may have been, would have been one of love, things may have been quite different for this family. If the church would have rallied around them as they went through this time of change, is it a possibility that this child might have met Jesus? Would they have turned away from a lifestyle that eventually becomes a burden? We already know that and does not fill that emptiness, that initial void that comes from so many children, so many young people. They're trying to figure out, where do I fit in this world? Can you imagine what they think today? Where do I fit? I just feel sometimes that Christians try to stand in the place of the Holy Spirit. They try to convict people of their sin. That is not our job. That is not our job at all. How about figuring out, um, well, this couldn't possibly please Jesus. This has got to make him mad. So I'm going to stand in that place. I'm going to fix it for him. Not our place. That is never what Jesus asked us to do. That's something we have to remember. Jesus came to save. He did not come to condemn anyone. Not a one of us. Jesus' anger, we've talked about this just recently, was toward his own people. If you read the stories in the New Testament, it was towards his own people. And it was because they were preventing people from coming to know who God truly was. They were preventing people to come to understand what the love of God was. And I want to go to clearing of the temple, because that's one that we talk a great deal of. Jesus was so angry when he walked into or came into Jerusalem and he saw that the temple was a what? It was a marketplace. And they were sitting there in the outer courts of the temple, and it was so crowded, and they were doing the money changing, which they had to do, because just like any of us, if we leave the country, we have to exchange our money in order for it to be good in other countries. So that's a legit thing. Um, and then also they would get uh, animals for sacrifice because it would be much easier for people to come and buy them there than to bring theirs from their own home. These are some of the things that have come up through this uh, outer court in the marketplace. But within that, they feel like that a lot of the people were taking advantage of these folks who were coming in to do what? This was the Passover. They were coming to worship. So they're being taken advantage of by who? People of God. How sad that is. And some of this money flow, they figure, was going into the temple. The outer court. The outer court was for the Gentiles and the Greeks, which is the same terminology in the Bible, to come and to be able to worship. That was the whole purpose, because they couldn't go into the inner courts, because that was for Jews only. And we have to remember that. So God's people, in a sense, had crowded this outer court so much, and there was so much turmoil going on, were God's people able to worship? Or were they being a stumbling block? Were they seeing things that, oh, well, I guess it's okay that we go and do these things? Think about that. So we know that the temple of God is no longer a place. We know that Jesus rebuilt it in three days. And the temple lies now 
within us. So during these times in our world, when we see sin, Christ resides in us. So do we go forward out of Christ's love? Do we depend on him to lead the way, to have people see who Christ is, that he is a God that loves humanity, all of humanity? Do we project that outwardly? Or do we become a stumbling block and be so full of things that are not of God that the temple is now not a worship place of worship. What was the passage that Deb read? Romans 12, 1. That our bodies do not become a sacrifice. Things to remember. And it, you know, it's, it's hard when you think about it, when you live in a world that so much is going on, but things were not any different back in the first century. Too much was going on. Lots of material things. That was another big bunny trail. Satan works his best through deception, through lies, and through confusion. Three things that obviously took place in this family's life. Not only for the family, but how about for the Christians where we're going, mm -hmm. no, we cannot have that. To people who loved their child instead of rallying around them. So all three of these things entered all of these people in this circumstance. Now throughout this Clash of Kingdoms series, I have mentioned all humanity just talked about is made in the image of God. His character, a likeness, mentally, morally, and spiritually. And I talk about it often. Why do I talk about it so often? So we can see others as God does. That's why. Now, I took some of the following because I found it. I thought, ah, oh, that fits. I talk about it so much, but it fits so well, the way it uh, organized it mentally. Humanity was created with free will and the capability to reason, a reflection of God's intellect and freedom. Morally, humanity was created in righteousness and perfect innocence, a reflection of God's holiness. Socially, Humanity was created for fellowship, relationship, what we talk about all the time. This reflects God's triune nature and his love. God's character is mentioned throughout the messages of 2616 continuously. The transformation that comes from redemption in God's marred image, it's in us being repaired. This marred image when we accept Christ, is being repaired, if we will allow it. And this is to reflect the character of God outwardly in this world. Due to the fall, as I mentioned in the first one, the choice of Adam and Eve, the image of God in us became flawed. Today, humanity still bears the image of God. It doesn't matter. They still bear His image. He is their creator but it is also damaged to sin. Mentally, morally, socially, and physically, humanity shows the effects of sin out in the world. Sin, think of this, is any lack of holiness and defect of moral purity and truth, whether in heart or life, whether of commission or omission. All unrighteousness is sin, and sin is against God. I looked up synonyms. Synonyms, my favorite word that I can hardly say. Because um, I enjoy looking at the different words. And I want you to listen to these words very closely. Crime, delinquency, depravity, evil, fault, immorality, misdeed, offense, ungodliness, wickedness, and wrongdoing. Anything that is against God is not of God. We look outwardly in the world today. Do we see those words? Do we see those very same things that I was just talking about? 
It exists in the world. Do we remember that all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God? Now think about those words. Do you put yourself in the place of those words? Before you came to Christ, do you put yourself there? Kind of a scary thing to think about, huh? I had thought, reading this, and I'm going to quote this. Labeling someone as evil, and I want us to hear these words too, can demonize them and seem to me we can do whatever we like to them. And that seems a bit strong. And it is. It's kind of ugly. But I'm going to give you some examples that come from so-called God-fearing people and others. How about the Crusades? Is anybody here familiar with the Crusades? That was wars fought in the name of Jesus Christ against Islam. Hundreds and thousands of people died at the Crusaders' hands. Hundreds and thousands of innocent people died at their hands. Catholics killed Muslims in the name of Jesus, and Muslims killed Catholics in the name of Allah. Catholics killed their own, as well as Protestants did. Latin Christians killing Greek Christians. Both the Catholic and the Protestant religions have killed in the name of God. I hope we've come past that state, because not only the fact that you can sit there and shoot someone and kill them dead, what about the tongue? What is the tongue compared to? Biblically, the tongue comes from hell. And the tongue can kill. That is in the Bible. If we are not careful of our words. Christians have gone after non-Christians and non-Christians after Christians. A whole history of the misrepresentation of who Jesus Christ is. Today we have the attacks on abortion clinics and the attack on those that stand opposed to abortion. There are attacks against the woke and the LBG alphabet people, their ideology, and attacks on those who don't agree with their beliefs. We could probably sit here all day long and pick out the evil that goes on in both the Christian and the non-Christian world. And it seems to me like it's a vicious cycle. But if you read your Bible, you are going to find out that that is how the world turns. That's the world that we live in. When people deny humanity of other people, people, humanity, they become evil themselves. I just gave you a list of the awful things that is considered sin that jumps over into evil. And in the Christian world, the only thing that will change the cycle, that will change our surrounding world, will be to choose to have the kingdom mindset. This means that anyone who belongs to Christ has become a new person. The old life is gone, a new life has begun. For he has rescued us from the kingdom of darkness and transferred us into the kingdom of his dear son who purchased our freedom and forgave our sins, 2 Corinthians 5.17 and Colossians 1.13. He is stepping into the life of Christ to allow the Holy Spirit, as Deb was talking to about, to change from the inside, to change us from the inside out. But we have to choose to do that because we have the gift of free will. Since you have heard about Jesus and have learned the truth that comes from him, throw off the old sinful nature and your former way of life, which is corrupted by lust and deception. Instead, let the Spirit renew your thoughts and attitudes. Put on your new nature, created to be like God, truly righteous and holy, coming by the gift of the Holy Spirit in each one of us. Ephesians 4, 21 to 24 is where that came from. This church hears those verses, verses continuously. I preach them all the time. Why? Because it is vital to the Christian lifestyle. It is vital to our salvation. My goal 
is for everyone to know the forgiveness and the love of Christ. You know, as Christians, sometimes we think we're so pious. Well, let me tell you, I know a slew of Christians who have stepped away from God. I know a bunch of Christians who have done that. I know people who claim to be Christians, who claim to have all of these religious ideas, who think they're very pious, but on a daily basis, they don't even show that. They do not live out their life in Christ. They do not live out what the kingdom of God is on a daily basis. But uh, let me tell you, I know Christians who do. Who do live out their life. But we become stepping outside of Christ. When we start becoming judgmental, we got problems. Because the true Christian should not be judgmental at all. God sets up the standards. We are allowed in the church, we are allowed certain boundaries and things that we can step into. Outside of the church, we do not judge anyone who does not know Christ. And I'm going to tell you this too. I know many people who have fallen away from Christ because of circumstances in their life that would crush your heart. And they feel like they have been abandoned. They've made some wrong moves in their life. They know him, but they have made mistakes. And it is one of the hardest things. I, I pray with a lady, pray for a lady, often that I heard these, this story from. And it broke my heart because she doesn't feel good enough. That's not true. Jesus Christ came to save and not to condemn. And many people fell. Who was Paul? Was he not a man of God? He was a man of God. And he stood in line to kill Christians. Please remember that. Deb mentioned the American dream that deserves a double wow. I loved it. Thank you for bringing that up. The American dream is the national ethos of the United States. A set of ideas including representative representative democracy, rights, liberty, and equality in which freedom is interpreted as the opportunity for individual prosperity and success, as well as upward social mobility for oneself and their children, achieved through hard work in a capitalistic society and very few barriers. I looked that up several times. There were quite a few meanings that came together. It sounds great, doesn't it? Sounds like a good place to be. But I will tell you right now, without Christ being centered in that life, the American dream ideology only becomes about self. That's a good one to remember. We live in the land of the free, the brave, started by Christians for religious freedoms, but we also have turned it into place for self. Self gratification. And those are the things that we need to walk away from. This series has brought so much thought to mind and wondering, are we doing things God's way or some other way? We are learning that, and I hope we are learning this, that our way, self-minded and the denomination way, church-minded, in the Christian is not always kingdom-minded. Not 100%, but it's not always kingdom-minded. So what does this kingdom-minded Christian look like? Paul writes, always be full of joy in the Lord. I say it again, rejoice. Let everyone see that you are considerate in all you do. Remember the Lord is coming soon, or other translations is near. Don't worry about anything. Instead, pray about everything. Tell God that you need and thank Him for all He has done. Then you will experience God's peace, which exceeds anything we can understand. His peace will guard your hearts and minds as you live in Christ Jesus. And now, dear brothers and sisters, one final thing. Fix your thoughts on what is true and honorable and right and pure and lovely and admirable. Think about these things. 
that are excellent and worthy of praise. Keep putting into practice all you learned and received from me, everything you heard from me and saw me doing. Then the God of peace will be with you. Philippians 4, 4 through 8. The joy that Paul is talking about brings a deep contentment that is in the Lord, and it is based in trusting the living God in all of our circumstances. Think about that. It's trusting in God in every circumstance we're in. Whether we have fallen, whether we are in the midst of a death, whether we are struggling in our walk with tri Christ, trying to, to get right on that path, regardless of what it is, whether we are being poured, poured down on with many blessings, whether we have money or we don't have money, we are to be thankful, and we are to be thinking of Christ in every circumstance. Verse 5 in this translation states, consider it, which is also translated as reasonableness. It is the disposition that seeks what is best for everyone, and not just oneself. The Lord takes care of business concerning the wrongs of others. We don't. We are to love others. We are to have grace and mercy. We all know what the Lord says about worry. There's one word that he says about worry. <laughs> That's the word. It's the word I got here. Don't. Don't. As children of God, we are not to be anxious. We are to put ourselves in God's hands, and his peace will guard us in Christ Jesus. Think of that. If we will do as he asks us to do, the promise of peace comes into our life and we can make it through everything that comes our way. Paul was in prison. Think about that when he wrote this letter. And he was singing hymns and giving thanks. Now can you imagine, because we know the prisons back in there were really bad. Prisons are like, you know, the luxury hotel nowadays compared to what they were back then. God is in control. There is absolutely no reason to worry or be anxious. And let's never forget the thankfulness that we need to have. We were talking, somebody and I were talking about that last week. You know, how do you be thankful in this or this and this and this? Well, when you start looking at the situations around you and you are able to be thankful, the thought pattern that goes through our minds actually starts changing. And it's a good thing to, to practice and to uh, put in your thoughts when something wrong happens. So there are two more very vital elements to this picture of having a kingdom mindset. One of the hardest, and it is forgiveness. Be kind and compassionate to one another forgiving each other, just as in Christ God forgave you. For if you forgive other people when they sin against you, your Heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others their sins, your Father will not forgive your sins. A little scary. Ephesians 4.32 and Matthew 6.14-15. That seems harsh. Some people may be going, what are you talking about? But I don't think it's really all that harsh. I don't. When I think about what God, the Father, our Father went through when he gave up his son for the forgiveness of our sins. Then lastly, we have love, which is actually what I believe is the most important, because God is love. We are being changed into the character of God through the Holy Spirit. God is love. And it is because of that love that his character reflects the attributes we talk so much about. It is why he gave his son, because God so loved the world. Miss Deb brought out the greatest commandment, which is in two parts. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, and with all your soul, and with all your mind. This the great and first commandment. And the second, hear these words. 
is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. And on these two commandments depend on the law and the prophets. Matthew 22. Without this love, all that we are thinking about, what we've been talking about, what I preach about all the time, would not be possible without this love. The kingdom life that Jesus initiated is summarized in these two commandments. These are the elements, love and forgiveness, that will enable these attributes talked about to be formed inside of each and every one of us here today. And it will keep the mind steadfast on Christ, and through this disposition, he will reflect the kingdom mindset and experience God's peace. And all of this outward mess, and think of this, that we were once a part of. Let's not forget that. Before we came to Christ, we were once a part of this. It will bring a different view and behavior towards others. Therefore, if you have any encouragement from being united with Christ, if any comfort from His love, if any common sharing in the Spirit, if there any tenderness and compassion, then make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love, being one in spirit and one in mind. Do nothing of, out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourselves, not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interests of others. Philippians 2, 1 through 4. Which will lead to seeking the kingdom of God above all else, living righteously, offering your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. Being in this world, but not of it. And lastly, I quote, I must know Jesus Christ as my Savior before his teaching has any meaning for me other than that of a lofty idea which only leads to despair. But when I am born again by the Spirit of God, I know that Jesus Christ did not come only to teach. He came to make me what he teaches I should be. The redemption means that Jesus Christ can place within anyone the same nature and rule that ruled his own life and all the standards God gives are based on that nature. What a beautiful place to be. To be in Christ in such a way that the love of Christ just absolutely flows to where there is no way that anybody can mistake who you are. To have a kingdom mindset is to strive, to strive for the things that God talks about in His Bible. And I don't really like that word because I believe that the Holy Spirit will enable us, but we have to trust in Him to do so, and we have to learn to step outside of this here that we see outward. We have to learn to do that. We have to learn to seek Him first. Every little bit that comes to us that we want to shake our heads out, we seek Him first. Then we can move outwardly with that love that He has given us. We are so blessed. I can't even imagine somebody not knowing who Christ is. We need to be on our feet. We need to stand strong. Let's pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, I come to you. And I'm so grateful for the messages that you have brought forth about who we are in you, the things that we go through in this world war, and how if we will seek after you, the words of our mouth and, and our actions will reflect who you are. And Heavenly Father, that our eyes will learn to see through your eyes, Lord Jesus, that we will step out in your feet, that we often say, and serve with your hands, that we often say also, Lord, but that within that, there is a heart that is rendered to you in taking action so 
this world who is hurting, Lord. You know, we look, we look at things and we know through your word that things may not change as far as how things are going forward before you come again. But we also know the lives that you have given us as your people, that we can make a difference with the people that you place in front of us, Lord. I pray, Heavenly Father, that the message that was heard today in some way has touched us to where we see even that much more, Lord. The things that I pray for every message, that we are changed, that we become changed people, Lord. And if there is something here that, that someone has seen within their own life, Lord, I pray as I did through this series and have been, Lord, that you will touch them in such a mighty way in knowing how much you truly do love them and that you are the ones that can change everything. I love you so much, Lord, and I thank you. In Jesus' most precious name, amen.